Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to share this story with you. Um, I'm going to provide a bit of background to this story, and then Wayne's going to jump up and share all the good stuff. And like any big project, there's always a backstory, and I'd call this one a roller coaster ride. So let's take a closer look. First of all, where are we talking about? I'd like to think that most of you know where Tauranga is, but for the sake of our, our friends who are joining us from overseas, this is where it is. And as we fly into the city, I know that we're all familiar with the, the beautiful beaches of the mount, drifting down to Papamā and so on, but it's possible that not many of you are so familiar with the CBD. And it's not, you're not alone. Most residents don't go there much either. But it's a really historical part of the, of the, of the city. It's a really important, uh, culturally important area. It's where the first uh, big waka landed. It's a place to gather kai. It was a place to trade. It's also a place of conflict. But now a city centre emerges. And this is the site that we're talking about, bracketed in yellow. And this is a council-owned site that, where the plan is to, to be, uh, have it redeveloped. So what are we talking about? Well, given the subject matter of today, we're clearly talking about regeneration and activation of the CBD. The, the, the Te Papa Peninsula. And this is by way of, of council delivering a suite of new community facilities in the centre of the city. The project name is Te Manawataki o Te Papa, the heartbeat of Te Papa. And it's a program of works taken on by council to regenerate and stimulate the CBD, both commercially and socially, and try and get some vibrancy and bring some heart back into the centre of the city. So why are we talking about it? You've probably picked up the memo. The CBD's in decline. It's probably been happening for 10 or more years, and even the cars are out of date, as you can see. There's a lack of investment, there's a lack of traffic, there's limited attraction. But what there is no lack of is for vacancy, vacancy signs. And it's a really sad reflection on two of the main streets or more in the CBD that have empty shops. But it's not entirely all doom and gloom. There's a couple of key areas that are doing okay. The Strand is a suite of, re of restaurants facing the waterfront. And in recent years, there's been some reinvestment by Waikato Re University with the development of the campus in the city. And while this is a great initiative and does wonders bringing students into the city, I suspect it struggled a bit post COVID, so the numbers are probably down. So these are all good things, but just not quite enough. And what I find is the real irony of Tauranga is that summer after summer, you can get all of these cruise boats pulling into the city and thousands of people dropping off. First thing they do, go for a wander around the mount, explore the beach. And then a large number of them will climb onto buses and go and explore what else is in the region instead of going into the CBD. Now there's another good why, it's the population. It's the fastest growing region in the country and it has been for some time. I think it's now the fifth biggest city in, in New Zealand. So what's needed is something to stimulate some investment and get, it, get a city, um, give the city some status. It's hoped that if council can take the first step, that this would stimulate more private investment and hopefully um, trigger that regeneration that we've been talking about. But the brutal fact is that that responsibility falls on council. So how do you do it? I mean, obviously council and the, the business community aren't immune to the fact that something has to be done, but you know, the initiatives are pretty lightweight. Street enhancements, maybe bespoke projects. And I'd quickly note too, though, that the, civic, that the feedback from the, from the local community has been invariably positive. Whenever council's engaged with the wider community, it's a positive endorsement to actually get something done, spend some money. But the frank reality has been that there is no clear plan and there is no money. But that all changed. The black mould of 2014. It was discovered in the civic administration buildings and staff um, were immediately um, evacuated and sent to the fringe of the city. 
except for a few key staff, including elected members. Um, but the mould never lived up to its reputation and the elected members remained there unaffected until 2020. But it's a really important moment in our programme because what it did do is it said we have to have a plan. And so Council commissioned Warren Amani and Land Lab and they generated a really cracking piece of work actually. And instead of just turning up and depositing, depositing a civic administration building on this beautiful site, they really tested the assumptions and they thought but broadly, more broadly about what community facilities should be in the heart of the city. It was about this time that 22 got introduced and we uh, just had the small task of trying to figure out how to make this all happen. There's a lot to consider, right? There's the fiscal challenges, there's the public consultation, there's iwi consultation, and then you've got to work through the mechanics of how do you actually deliver new buildings from a resource perspective, you know, the local building community and so on. So we very quickly came to a few conclusions, and the number one piece of advice was, council, please, don't do this on your own. You have to go to market. You really need to find a development partner. A development partner's got the potential to give you a wider lens on what's possible, and they bring expertise, and there's less chance of a screw up. We also explored alternate funding possibilities from PPPs through the government support. It culminated with an expression of interest that went out into the market in 2017. And it's a really well-structured document, if I don't mind saying so, and it was um, warmly received, much it greatly exceeded our expectations, really high-quality responses from all around the country and internationally, not quite 99, but it was a pretty good response. And at the end of a very robust evaluation, Willis Bond was successful. And that relationship was consummated in 2018 with a partnering agreement. And it's worth reflecting on this agreement just for a moment because Many of you will have seen sort of wishy-washy partnering principles in various agreements. Uh, but this bad boy had a lot, more be a lot better features. A robust design and feasibility process, values based by local principles, off-ramps for the parties, transparent pricing. But then we hit some challenges. Because in theory we should have started in 2019. But unfortunately, political disruption and dysfunction got in the way. We found at the time the elected members were just a bit too cynical about the whole process, and I think it was because they just had so much going on in that vicinity, within the whole region. There's lots of hidden agenda, and my, my personal view is that it was just too significant a decision for them to process. Incredibly frustrating, public support strong, the need being so great, and then we found other problems, title issues, Public Works Act, Reserves Act, but probably most important, a really unresolved issue with local iwi. I mean, the site was of real significance to iwi, and that story hadn't been heard, let alone resolved. So everything stops for about 18 months, and while we're all pulling our hair out, we just have to acknowledge the patience shown by Willis Bond at this point who could have easily walked away. But then the heavens opened. The miracle happened. 2021, the Minister of Local Government stepped in and the elected members were removed. It's an absolute bolt from the blue and a game changer. And this is a huge moment in the context of the Tamanawataki project because clearly we've been stalled. Four independent commissioners are appointed, chaired by Anne Tolley. And believe me, they had a very long list of priorities that they had to sort out in the region, but the CBD was very near the top. We'd also note that the commission coupled seamlessly with a very strong CEO in Marty Grenfell. He's a highly motivated guy and he's got this great ability to unblock the usual barriers found within councils. And he could see this was a massive opportunity for change. But just circling back to the Commission for a moment, when I first met with them, the first thing they said, the city's dead, what are we doing about it? And instead of just accepting all of the work that had been done for the years beforehand, they took a really forensic look at all of it, including the relationship with Willis Bond. And even despite all of that testing, determined 
It was absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, it supported it wholeheartedly, and they left us with one really clear instruction. You better get cracking. So that's what happened. Tower and Council's team, project team, grew from two, and when I was in the office the other day, there was, it was up to 30, and that doesn't include Willis Bond's team. So what are our learnings? Number one, top of the list for me, develop an ambitious master plan. These things can always be scaled back, but if you don't jump in and explore all of the possible um, community functions, building functions, you, you're just doing the process injustice, and you're not serving justice to the site and its history. But well, we've been super impressed with all the creatives who have been involved in this process, and how they tie all of these elements of the city together, and this really has the potential to be the catalyst for some significant change. Really important to get an experienced partner and a robust agreement. There were lots of people in the market, developers in particular locally, who said they could do it faster and they could do it cheaper. But none of them had done anything at scale, and let alone, let alone done it particularly well. You need to figure out where the money's going to come from. We spent a lot of time looking at alternative solutions, as I mentioned, PPPs, ground leases, and so on. But the, but the brutal reality is that they're very hard to hide in the balance sheet. And so the Commission ultimately decided that Council would pay its own way. And we're really fortunate that we had a, a partner that was willing to uh, be flexible in that regard. I'd stress the importance of working alongside Tangata Whenua, understanding the history of the site, the grievance, working through resolving it. Understanding that narrative, it's worked its way into the design. And now one of the real highlights of the design thus far is seeing how that's reflected. But also note that the, whether it's by a quirk of timing or um, the nature of economic change, but the private sector seems to be starting to respond, even though we haven't got these buildings out of the ground. I think the more that um, Council's communicated its intention, and uh, it shows that there's a bit of, they've got some runs on the board, it's just coincided with the private sector responding. And maybe it's just that timing, maybe it's because you can actually see it's a CBD worth investing in, uh, particularly with the population that supports it. We have new commercial buildings coming out of the ground, a major retail development in the farmer's building, hotels are proposed, and now council's even thinking about maybe if going, being a bit more ambitious, including a stadium, which in my view is feasible. They're talking about an aquatic centre, and we're certainly talking about a hotel and conference centre, again on a council-controlled piece of land. But for me, one of the best decisions that they made following the black mould is they took the Civic Administration Building and took it off Tamana Wataki. Let Tamana Wataki be about the community and its facilities. Let the Civic Administration Building go further down the road, about 300 metres. Another very good Warren Amani building with great sustainability values, delivered by Willis Bond, traditional development, tenant landlord relationship. But the most important thing is a thousand people coming to one spot, and the activation that cre they ca cre can create will be significant. My final point really is that there's no substitute for, for political will. And I'm not going to stand here and sort of comment on the problems of local government in New Zealand or how the previous council couldn't get out of first gear. But what I will say is that this commission has acted with great integrity and real respect for the process of local government. Every decision I've seen them process, they've dealt with it in a really robust way. But the point of difference is that every time that decision is made, it's made unanimously, it's made with clear direction. And in the case of uh, Tamana Wataki, they share the vision and they want to be part of it. It's also an opportunity, they've also prioritised resolving the relationship with iwi. They've created a really unique situation where the, the civic site is now in a co-ownership arrangement and that's done um, an awful lot of good to build trust and inclusiveness. And it's also an opportunity to shout out to the good folk at Tauranga City Council, past and present, who have worked on this project for a number of years. We've laughed and we've cried, but we've ultimately been validated. 
So as at a couple of weeks ago, uh, a council controlled organisation has been established, a CCO, uh, with four independent board members who bring enormous experience to the table, just to add another layer of great governance and, and um, surety over the process. And as the newly appointed chair recently said, the facilities and activities planned for the civic precinct will draw people from near and far, helping add vibrancy and breathe life into the civic centre. And now it's just up to Wayne to deliver it. Thanks, David. Um, look, I've got 15 minutes to uh, try and not bore you and rush through the master plan as it currently sits. This is a very fluid um, state. We're currently at a stage of detailed design on a variety of buildings, um, but I can talk you through um, the design intent and, the, um, and where we're at in the process. So um, if my slides can magically appear, that would be great. Um, look, um, the civic precinct and the land that we're talking about here kind of bookmarks the northern edge of the CBD. So those of you who are familiar with Tauranga will sort of know roughly where we are. Um, it's in the kind of the heart of the Te Papa land there, which no one seems to voluntarily want to go to unless they're forced to go there at the moment. So it's, it's a bit of a, an area devoid of attraction and um, kind of... Um, in, you know, interesting places to be. This is an aerial view of the site. Um, after this was um, photo was taken, um, the building immediately underneath the site A description there is the old library building that has been demolished. Um, and the, the land that's the subject of this presentation is what is described as site A in Masonic Park and leading down to the waterfront. Uh, Masonic Park sort of is a very, um, well to call it a park is quite a very, I think, an ambitious stretch. It is um, a car park with some public toilets uh, that various people hang around that you probably wouldn't want to frequent with during the day um, and, you know, blocking you off from the waterfront. So this is sort of the inheritance. This is what we've got, demolished buildings, car parks, and a pretty forlorn uh, landscape. Um, but what, is, um, what else you can't really appreciate from the, um, the photograph here is the, the challenge of the typology is that there's a 13 metre fall from Durham Street to the water's edge. So what we're trying to do here, what the brief is to create a gathering place, a place that will bring people and, and keep people, and uh, locate a series of buildings which speak to each, each other uh, across a, a fall of 13 metres, and in particular across I, side A, immediately falls about 10 metres. And that's a very significant design challenge that was put in front of the team to try and reconcile all of those uses and needs uh, across a typology like that. Um, I mean, it's interesting to note there just how much of the area is given over to car parking in its current state. And, you know, in car parking, say what you like, is a dead space and a kind of a, a, not a public use of land. Um, so while the brief is to deliver a series of buildings, the starting point for this whole ex design exercise was to talk about what is going to go on in the building. So what we wanted to do was focus on activities and then the buildings would come out of that analysis. So these are just a selection of the kinds of things that we're trying to promote in this, um, in this master plan. So things like hosting, welcoming, educating, shaping, nurturing, discovering, learning, entertaining, eating. You know, these, are the, these are the activities we want to encourage. Alongside those, we had a brief from council about a series of buildings that were needed in the CBD. And they were a library, a central library to replace the one that had been demolished, a museum, which doesn't exist at the moment. There is no Tauranga Museum at the moment, which is a pretty um, stark reality around an area with enormous cultural history um, in it. Um, a, a visitor inf information centre, um, uh, a performance venue, a convention centre or conference venue, and an exhibition centre. So these were the kind of the requirements about how do we accommodate these um, within this space. Um, what 
became very important to the design team early on is the recognition of the power of, of water, both physically, literally, and also metaphorically. So the site, you'll remember, leads to the waterfront, and naturally the water course, historically, has seen the fall um, lead to water going from the high point to the low point on the site. Historically, Waka would pull up on the waterfront here, um, and um, local Maori would bring um, uh, fish and other trade items onto this land and trade here with other tribes. It was also a place of gathering, a social gathering for local iwi and learning and education and nurturing. So it was really important for the design team to embrace those historic cultural uses and incorporate them into our master plan. Um, also, there's an adjacent street next to our site called Spring Street, and that also speaks to a, natural, a, a number of natural um, springs and uh, water courses that nurtured this area and enabled it to be a productive site historically. So we saw this constant theme of water, and look, it's not that um, great to promote that in Auckland in 2023, but believe me, water can be a good thing uh, from the heavens occasionally. So we've embraced this concept of water and all of its sort of um, metaphorical and literal um, messaging in the design. What that leads you to is a design expression which is quite fluid in its delivery, um, uh, curved edges, um, buildings which are quite sinuous on the landscape, buildings that have permeability, so in the same way that water will find a path through canyons, through creeks and through the beach. We wanted to create buildings that were not hard, fixed, um, uh, sort of impervious um, structures on the landscape, but that allowed people to come and go through them. So you'll see, hopefully, in the designs, a really strong representation of, of that water influence. The other thing, too, that that leads you to um, in a design sense is the use of natural materials, uh, natural colours, um, and you know, very much a, a, um, a soft um, representation um, in the buildings in, in the way they're expressed. This is the master plan, and we'll have some more illustrative renders coming up shortly, but there's a series of buildings here, and I'll go back to the use of description of buildings, remembering that it's what goes on inside the buildings which we think is the most important thing. But what was um, really significant for the design team was it's okay about creating a series of destinations. At the moment, the CBD is a very lonely place to visit. In fact, you don't visit there unless you have to go there. Um, one of the stark um, bits of data that was put on the table early on in this process is pre-COVID, um, there are 80 cruise ships a year landing at the port of Tauranga, 200,000 visitors a year to the port, hop on buses, and not one single bus goes to the CBD. So they go to the Mount, they go to Rotorua, they go to Hobbiton, they go anywhere except the CBD. So to attract people, you need to create a destination and a reason to be there. But our challenge is more than just to, to create attractors. We wanted to create places where people linger. And so people will come to a library or a museum for a purpose, but what will hold them in this location, we believe, is the public spaces. It's the public realm. It's the landscape. So early on, we decided that the landscape had an equal priority or potentially greater priority than the physical buildings that we were developing here. Now what that means is that um, in laying out the master plan, the largest building with the greatest bulk, we situated on the southeastern corner. So um, I don't, do I have a laser? Yeah, I do, there we go, a laser. So this building here where is the community hub building. Now this is a, a building which has the functions of a library and the community services function. So, you know, your immediate council interaction, how do I pay my rates, um, dog, collection, dog registration, all that sort of stuff, customer services there, but also a library and a number of community bookable rooms uh, available for um, the community to um, access. And so we have not called this a library, although it performs the function of a library, but a whole bunch of other things. So this community hub building is the building with the greatest bulk and the greatest height in the smallest area. So it's situated to the southeast, so shading is minimised into this public area here. North is straight up the page, sort of this way. 
and west in the west here, so your setting sun is out here. So the idea is that we locate buildings with lower scale to the north, so the shading into this public space in the middle, the throat of the site, is minimised. So we have a community hub building here. Um, to the north eastern corner, we have the Plan Museum here, and then joining onto it is an exhibition centre. Um, and then next to that is a building which is joined at um, a ground level but sits uh, individually above it. And this is building, is, we've called it the Civic Faray. And to our, to our knowledge, there's no other example of a similar building in New Zealand at the moment. So this building is designed around the Maori design um, ethos, and it'll be the home of the democratic function for Tauranga when it's built. So all council meetings will take place in this building. Um, it'll be accessible to the public. It will be a meeting and greeting place, so if dignitaries or, or VIPs come to Tauranga who have a, an official um, greeting ceremony, it will take place in this space. And stitching all of this together is a landscape plan that leads right down to the waterfront here. So the council are doing a number of waterfront improvements here. Uh, and this site is essentially um, linked to the waterfront through this landscape area, which holds uh, the public in a series of what we call kind of gateways or staging points. So remembering there's a fall here of 13 metres, so you potentially can have outdoor concerts in a number of different locations through here, and even smaller intimate busker-style um, arts and crafts activities. You could have market activities through here as well. So um, it's a combination, the landscape is a combination of hard stand and grass, but there's a very heavy skew towards greening of this area, which um, Anne Tolley is particularly, um, particularly focused on as a keen gardener, so we've had a lot of pressure to put this as green as possible. But also we need to recognise that this will be a heavily trafficked area if we've done our job well. There'll be a lot of people stomping around here. Um, so there is, a, there is a need for a minimum level of hard um, paving as well. Because there's such a steep rise here, there's a series of ramps to enable um, less abled people to get to the Civic Faray, which the Civic Faray is the kind of the heart of this project, which has been described as the heartbeat of Tauranga City. And within this project, the heart of this project is the Civic Faray, which sits proudly at the end of a journey up from the waterfront, and it's specifically sited there because it has line of sight to the Moana. And again, this is a very symbolic, important link for local Māori that this building here can see and visualise the ocean and welcome people from the ocean to, um, to, to Manawataki or to Papa. There's a sculpture garden planned here, uh, and in a, in a separate development that we're involved with, with Council, we're hoping to get a hotel and convention um, centre on this block here, but that's not the purpose of today's presentation. Where am I going? Flip. Um, I might skip past that. Well, no, I won't skip past this. Um, mana Whenua involvement in the project has been absolutely fundamental. David's touched on the importance of this land culturally and historically. I'd love to give you a full history on the, it's a fascinating history of this land, but I haven't got time to do that now, but I do encourage you to research it if you're able to. But through this master plan refresh process, which has taken place after commissioners were appointed, we had three elders sitting at the table with us, um, which is a miracle um, in, a, in and of itself, working with us, uh, guiding this design um, process. One of those, just to give you a hint of the history, one of those three elders um, has actually been in prison for occupying this land. So he's been in, in Mount Eden. So for him to be sitting at the table with us, um, you know, arm in arm, walking side by side on this design journey was just a tremendous honour for us. Um, so that's gone. So this is the community hub building uh, in its current um, design form. Um, we have resource consent for this building and construction is due to commence um, by the uh, end of this year. This is a, a three-storey building, just over 5,600 square metres of space. Um, the exterior facade, uh, this is a Studio Pacific designed building, Studio Pacific architecture. 
Um, and the facades are this really fantastic. Um, it's based on a, a local um, vegetation, Māori vegetation, and, and these are glass panels which are alternating clear and then um, sort of shaded um, glass. Um, the facade is still being developed and it's probably not going to be quite as uniform as is demonstrated here, but we're, we're evolving that. There's a first floor terrace that sits in here, which is open to the elements, um, and a main entrance here into the plaza, and an, en and an entrance on the other side um, coming off Wharf Street as well on the other side. Just kind of whizzing through, I'm running out of time so I'll move very quickly. Um, just as a floor plan of the building, again, sort of note the curves and the uh, sinuous nature of it. This is a kiosk, which is sort of joined, um, but as a separate um, footprint adjacent to the building. This, will, this is where eyesight will be, and site-wide ticketing for events like um, exhibitions uh, and performance events can all be executed out of um, this ticketing kiosk. Uh, I'll whiz through here. Ground floor, there's a cafe. Uh, customer service, bookable rooms, as you get further up the building, the lending services for the library uh, going on. So um, I'm just whizzed through, you don't need to see that, it's a bit boring. The um, Museum Exhibition Civic Fare, we've got this very crude acronym called CWEM, which is um, lazy people, um, can use it to describe it. The museum sits um, uh, on the eastern side of the site, um, uh, against the street, uh, and is connected through to the exhibition centre, which connects at upper levels. And uh, I said the Civic Fare um, is connected at ground level, below ground level, so there's a sharing of back of house and, and um, toilets and so forth um, between those buildings. But there's essentially three separate buildings. I won't, don't read that. There's, um, but just the image on the bottom right just shows you how the building connects. Um, so you can see how the museum links through to the exhibition centre itself. Um, uh, the form of the building, it's, again, it's quite um, Māori inspired um, and this is uh, designed by uh, Warner Māori Architecture and uh, they, uh, I've learned a new phrase, the best thing about uh, being involved in a new project is always architects like to throw, away, throw around interesting phrases so I now know what a baguette is and if you think it's a French piece of bread you're sadly mistaken. Um, uh, this, the, the facade here is terracotta baguettes. Uh, and I've yet to see one in the flesh, but I'm assured that they exist. And they're symbolic of um, vessels that the Maori used to hold taonga in the past. So the inspiration for the design you can see in those images on the left there. Um, hey, represented. I'll, I'll whiz through the floor plans. You don't, don't really want to know about that. Civic Whare, um, That's a, this is a really exciting building. As I said, it's the centerpiece of the project, the heart of the project. It's only barely 600 square metres in size, uh, but a really bold design, um, and you know, the, the public face of democracy for Tauranga. So this will be where all council decisions are debated in the future, um, and accessible to the public, and kind of VIP greeting. So uh, yeah, it's a really beautiful, I think, uh, inspired design. Wood on the outside, I should say that the library is a, a wooden building, um, so that'll be a six-star green building. I haven't really got time to dwell on sustainability. And to the degree that we can, we'll, in, we'll use wood throughout the exhibition centre and the museum as well, although some of the spans are quite long and we're just working through with the engineers whether or not steel has to be used um, at all. Um, the interesting thing about the Civic, um, the, the Civic Fare building is we have these formats which it can operate in, so it's... Um, uh, what we see here is kind of the council format. So, you know, you've got the elected members, you've got the public and the media gathered around in a, in a meeting format. You've got what they call a conference format or a meeting format, so you can have a presentation here to a group of 160 people. This is the more traditional um, Maori greeting format where you sit outside and you have oratory here in the Atea. Um, and then we have kind of breakout formats here. So this building, small building, can wear a number of different cloaks and operate in a number of different ways. So, you know, we're very excited about the uses that it can be put to. The landscape, again, just sort of briefly touching on the landscape. Again, this is one of the most vital parts of the master plan is just how this stitches together. This is what will cause people to stay in the area uh, and linger 
and kind of create a place to be. So rather than having buildings where people just come and go, we want people to hang around um, and just experience the best of Tauranga, which we think is probably the climate and the, and the sea. So that's why we've descaled the buildings and promoted the landscape. Um, that's a bit more on the landscape. Let's skip past that. Masonic Park, this is what I said was a public toilet in a car park today um, and you know, very grim space. This is a series of, of staging points on the way down to the waterfront with the ter with shading here uh, and some, there'll be some water features in there as well. So a really exciting kind of attractor um, for the public. And this is our vision for it. This is one of the renders um, on how we hope it will be um, used. You'll see, and I haven't had the time really to dwell on it, the roads are being tuned here. If you'd noticed on the photo of the existing site, you would have probably seen the most prominent thing other than car parks was buses. And so the idea is that this is a detuned space where pedestrians uh, and non heat vehicle traffic um, are discouraged and pedestrians are encouraged. So these will still be a legal road. There'll be no buses coming through here. Buses will be circulated around the exterior of the site. It'll still be a legal road, but it'll read not dissimilar to Fort Street or Elliott Street, which is a, a pedestrian-friendly place where you, the, the cars will mingle with pedestrians in a safe way. So that's the vision, uh, and uh, we're really looking forward. Looking, we're breaking ground, planning to break ground before the end of this year, and it's probably a five to six year construction uh, process from woe to go. So hopefully one day I'll be here to show you photos of um, the finished product. Thank you.